Tonight, uh, we're going to begin our, our uh, discussion on the gifts of the Holy Spirit, and uh, this will be kind of an introduction to that topic, and we'll probably spend a good three or so weeks on, on this. Uh, I'm in no hurry. Are you, are you in a hurry to, to get done? Or I just, if this takes us a year to go through, then it takes us a year. That's all right with me, but we're going to learn, and we're going to grow and we're going to hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. And uh, so this, uh, this next few weeks, we're going to be getting into the gifts of the Holy Spirit and what it is that God has given to us and how it works in our lives and uh, what it's all about. And my prayer and my hope and my passion, my desire is to see all of us not only learning about these things, but stepping out in them, not simply... Uh, studying the, the Holy Spirit and who He is and how He works, but experiencing the Spirit of God in ways that we haven't, uh, we haven't done before and living out His life uh, uh, in us. And so I'm just praying that, that there will be great fruit and much fruit from the time that we're taking uh, in studying the Spirit of God over the last... This is actually our 16th lesson, 16 weeks so far that we've been uh, studying this. And if you are kind of new and you haven't been here for a lot of it, I, you, can, you can find these teachings on, uh, on uh, uh, YouTube. It's on the internet. It's, you can go to our website and just take some time and go back and, and, and uh, catch up, uh, learn about the different things. Maybe you want to review something that was talked about that maybe there were things that were a little fuzzy or you want to just refresh your mind. And I just encourage you to use those tools that are there. And uh, so that you're growing in these things. Um, 1 Corinthians chapter 12 is where we want to start tonight. 1 Corinthians 12, and Paul is going to take three chapters uh, to talk about the gifts of the Spirit in 1 Corinthians. Now, there are other places in the Scriptures that talk about the gifts, and we're going to look at all of them, and we're going to, we're going to work through each one. But as Paul begins this subject, he says in verse 1, Now concerning spiritual gifts, brothers, I do not want you to be unaware. Um, one of the central and most important pieces to the life of the body of Christ, to what it means to be a, a man or woman of God, is the receiving and the understanding and the using of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Uh, this, is, this is critical to what it means to be the church and what it means to be a Christian. Sometimes these things get separated, and, and the gifts of the Spirit are, in some circles, kind of optional. Well, you know, we believe that God, the gift of the Spirit comes when you receive Christ as your Savior, and that's the gift, and, you know, everything else kind of gets set in the back. But, but in Paul's mind and in, the, in the, uh, the ethos of the New Testament, that's not the way it is at all. Yes, the Holy Spirit definitely is a gift. Yes, the gift of salvation um, introduces the life of the Spirit into our lives. But there's far more to it than that. There's a lot more going on. And, and in Paul's mind, when he addresses the churches in the New Testament about uh, church life, it's just assumed in his mind that the men and women of that congregation, whoever he's talking to, are flowing and operating and working in the gifts of the Spirit. It's just a part of what it meant to be the church in the early church. And so there was never any discussion of any options about the gifts. What Paul does when he writes is he either encourages people to step into the gifts or he does some correction because of uh, maybe an overemphasis or, or not understanding some part of uh, the, the gifts of the Spirit. And so here in the Corinthian church, he says, I just, I don't want you, some translations say, I, I don't want you to be ignorant about the, the gifts of the Spirit. I don't want you to be uninformed about them. Uh, in fact, it's interesting. Um, Paul didn't plant all the churches in, 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 uh, that are mentioned in the New Testament, obviously. He was the primary apostle to the Gentiles. He planted many of the churches that these letters come from. But, for example, Paul didn't plant the church in Rome. 
uh, that church was planted by another group of believers. And, but Paul writes to the Romans, uh, the book of Romans. And when he writes to them, he just assumes that they're flowing and functioning and moving in the gifts of the Spirit. Uh, go over to Romans chapter 12, someone. Romans 12. And in fact, you see there in your outline, there's three scriptures. Let's take a look at those three scriptures. Romans 12, 6 through 8. Who will read that for us? Okay. And who will read 1 Thessalonians 5, 19 to 22? Okay. And Galatians 3, 5. Who will read that one for us? Galatians 3, 5. Who's got it? Okay. Okay. All right. Romans 12, 6 through 8. What does that say? Now, Paul just, he doesn't, he doesn't introduce this at all. He just says, look, as a part of the activity of the, of the day, as the body of Christ in Rome, a, a place, by the way, that I didn't plant, a place I haven't been yet, just, just know that you need to uh, go after these gifts. You need to be functioning in them. What I'm trying to show is that, that uh, uh, operation of the gifts of the Spirit, prophecy, healings, tongues and interpretation, word of wisdom, word of knowledge, steps of faith, miracles. These things were just a normal part of the body of Christ in the early church. It's just the way things were in the early church. Um, 1 Thessalonians 5, 19 to 22, what does that say? Okay, and Galatians 3, 5, what does that say? Okay, so these are just in his argument about something else. He's teaching about other things. He just, as a matter of fact, talks about the operation of the gifts in these churches. And uh, so this is a very important thing for us because in our culture and in our time, these things are oftentimes looked at as options, uh, things that the church can either do or not do, but you can still be a church without these things in operation. And that, was, that never entered into the mind of the early church. If we're a church, we're flowing in the gifts of the Spirit. We have to, and we're going to see why as we go along tonight. So tonight I want to kind of begin uh, this study, and, and um, we, uh, in just introducing some of these things, I, I want to talk for a moment about uh, what the gifts are and what the gifts are for, uh, basically, uh, on kind of a, in kind of a broader picture. Paul says, I don't want you to be unaware, uh, other translations say ignorant, uh, uninformed. Uh, he wants us to clearly understand the gifts of the Spirit and what their purpose is and, and how they're to be used effectively. And so that's kind of my intention as well as we go into this particular phase of our teaching. And I want to start with a few terms that the Bible uses uh, in regards to the, uh, to the spiritual gifts. There, there are things that, there language that's used uh, that the Bible uses in talking about the gifts. And it's helpful for us to understand what some of these ideas are, and some of these words are. The first one is charisma. How many have heard of charisma? Anybody have any charisma? No, probably not. But anyway, charismata is the plural uh, uh, gifts. It's translated gift or gifts, and it's used 17 times in the New Testament, this word. It's the primary word that's used when we talk about uh, gifts. Uh, and I've listed the, 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 all the places where it's used in your notes uh, we're not going to take time tonight to, to read all of them, but I encourage you to do that. But there's something about this word that I want you to, that I want you to see, and it really helps us 
uh, in understanding what the gifts are for and what they're about. Um, the root of the word charisma or charismata is the word charis, charis. And what is that word in Greek, charis? Anybody know? Grace, that's right. It's in your notes. You can look, you can cheat. Grace. Charis is the word grace. It's a beautiful, beautiful word. And here's what I want you to see in this, because it's important as we go along. In the heart of every gift, uh, every charisma is grace. The heart of every gift of the Spirit is the grace of God. Listen, the gifts of the Spirit are the power of grace. The gifts of the Holy Spirit are literally grace that is empowered by uh, the Spirit of God. Uh, that is really important for us in understanding what the gifts are for and how they operate and what they're to do uh, in, in the church. Um, a gift, a spiritual gift, is a concrete manifestation of the grace of God. Hallelujah. Oh, man, just let that thought just sink into your spirit. And it's a concrete manifestation of the unmerited, unearned favor of the Lord. That's what a spiritual gift is. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 11 says, But one and the same Spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually just as he wills. We're going to take that verse apart in just a minute, but one theologian writes about this, that gifts are an individuation of the power of the grace of God. It's where the Holy Spirit takes this grace that's been poured out onto us and he takes a portion of that and, and brings it individually to Vi. And Vi takes that gift that she has been given and manifests it to bring glory to God and to edify the body of Christ. And we're going to that, that in just a minute. But this is, this is the beauty of what the gifts of the Spirit are. They are concrete manifestations of the grace of God. Now, that's something that, that we need to think about because we tend to think about spiritual gifts as the power of God. We, we see them as demonstrations of power. We talk about demonstrations of God's authority, tech, uh, demonstrations of God's dominion over darkness, all of these things. None of those things are wrong, but they miss the heart of what a spiritual gift really is about. And what it's really about is a manifestation of God's grace into the world, through your life into whatever it's meant to do. And we'll look at that in a minute. So... Every time you use a spiritual gift, something you receive from the Lord, if it's prophecy, it's a manifestation of God's grace. If it's healing, it's a manifestation of God's unmerited favor. Uh, the uh, word of wisdom, it gets you out of a fiery situation. It's God's grace at work. It's a concrete, tangible portion of his grace manifested in and, and through your life. That's a, powerful, that's a powerful idea, the charismata. Charisma in our culture, and someone who, someone who is charismatic in our cultural vernacular just means someone who has kind of a magnetic personality, somebody who's kind of, you know, gregarious today hey, I'm a charismatic guy and people are attracted to people like him and all that kind of stuff and that's been kind of the brand that's been put on charismatics uh, we are charisma they're crazy people over there they're funny people over there they're warm people they're friendly people they're loving people they're kind of, that's all fine 
but it misses the heart of what really is going on in us. And that is that we've experienced the unmerited favor of God, of a Jesus who loves us. Hallelujah. And, and even though we've just made a mess out of our lives, we've got a God who loves us and has taken the mess that we've made and transformed that mess into something beautiful, into something powerful. And we've yielded our lives to the point where God, by his spirit, can individuate his grace in my life and through my life so that if there's someone that God directs me to that needs healing in their body, the grace of God can flow through me and heal that person's body. So it's not about a magnetic personality. It's about a heart of grace, the heart of the grace of God being manifested in the world. Hallelujah. Any questions on that or thoughts or songs or hymns or spiritual songs? You okay? Okay, we'll keep going. Here's the next word. Um, pneumatica. And it's a plural. And it is uh, translated spiritual gifts in the New Testament. And the root of pneumatica is pneuma. And we've studied that word before. What does that word mean? Wind. The breath of God. Pneuma. The spirit. It's a word for the Holy Spirit. The pneuma. Uh, the study of the Holy Spirit. The theological discipline of the Holy Spirit is called pneumatology. The study of the spirit. The study of the wind. <laughs> the study of the spirit. Um, let's look at a couple scriptures on this. 1 Corinthians 12, 1, we looked at. Uh, this is where pneumatica is used. Now, concerning uh, spiritual gifts, brethren, I do not want you to be unaware. Go over to chapter 14 of 1 Corinthians. 14 of 1 Corinthians. And would someone read verse 1 there? Okay. Uh, uh, again, the word pneumatica is used. Desire earnestly. Desire earnestly spiritual gifts. The pneumatica. Romans 1.11 has the same idea. But here's the key. Both charismata and pneumatica, these two words, are translated uh, spiritual gifts or the gifts of the Spirit. That's how they're used. And it's what they mean, the gifts of the Spirit. But there's a difference in emphasis, and that's why the Bible, use, they're, they're used interchangeably. You see them, you know, when Paul are, is writing about them, sometimes he'll use, in Greek, he'll use pneumatica, sometimes he'll use charismata, but they always are translated the same. But they emphasize two different things. Now, we already said what charismata emphasizes. What does it emphasize? What is at the root or the heart? Grace. What does the pneumatica emphasize? What's the heart of that word? The spirit, the spirit. So the one, charismata, uh, emphasizes the, the ministry of that gift. What is going on in that gift? You are experiencing grace. You're experiencing the grace of God, where pneumatica emphasizes the giver of that grace. It directs you to the Holy Spirit, that you are experiencing the Spirit. You are experiencing something that the Spirit of God has given you. He has given you your healing. He has given you your deliverance. He has given you your miracle. He has given you that word of knowledge. That came from the Spirit. And so the, the two words are both translated spiritual gifts, but they emphasize different things and different ideas. And that's the beauty of the Word of God. It's so rich. It's, it's, there's so many things to just, to just camp on for a while and just say, God, I just, you know, I, I could have really gotten hung up that time I got healed just thinking about power. And I thank you for your power, Lord. But I needed to thank you for your grace. I need to just thank you. I don't deserve to be healed. There's nothing in me that warrants your grace. It's unmerited, and yet you do it, Lord. 
you do it. And you can just receive the grace of God. You can receive that connection from the Spirit, uh, the gift that's freely given by the, the Spirit. Hallelujah. Any, any questions or comments on these two words? Okay, another uh, phrase that I just want to, by way of introduction tonight, uh, a phrase that's used um, in 1 Corinthians 12, 7, the manifestation of the Spirit, manifestation of the Spirit. This is uh, 1 Corinthians 12, verse 7, but each one is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. Now, it doesn't say each one have been given manifestations of the Spirit. It's the manifestation. It's the same with fruit, the fruit of the Spirit. Galatians uh, 5, to 23 lists uh, several, love, joy, peace, patience, long-suffering, all those. He lists all those, but he doesn't say these are the fruits of the Spirit. He says these are the fruit of the Spirit, singular. Um, and can anybody think why that would be? Why is this, you know, I mean, there's lots of gifts. Why are we thinking just manifestate singular? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Manifestation of the Spirit. Any other ideas? Why, why is it written that way? Yeah, David. Good, good. There's not more. Okay, good. Anybody else? Other thoughts? The uh, gifts of the Spirit, the fruit of the Spirit, they are ways in which the manifest, the, the Holy Spirit manifests himself, uh, makes himself known uh, among his people. It's a manifestation. And so the operation of the gifts, plural, is a manifestation, singular, of the Spirit. He is not, um, this is a tough one to talk about, uh, but it, it, the Spirit is, is, is not secretive. The Spirit is not uh, um, hidden. He makes himself known. In fact, he wants to make himself known. Uh, Paul talks about, don't grieve the Spirit. Don't shut him out. Don't shut him down. But when gifts are happening in the body of Christ, let's say we gather together for worship, and this one has a word in, in uh, tongues, and this one has the interpretation of tongues, and someone over here gets healed, and someone else receives a word of knowledge that, that uh, opens up some, uh, and helps someone else's life. All of those things are the manifestation of the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. It, it's just a sign that God has shown up. God is with us. Hallelujah. The Spirit is manifesting himself, and when he manifests himself, gifts begin to pop. Have you ever taken a, one of the fun, my, my, I have some magnets that sit on my, uh, on my uh, desk in there, and Jack, my little grandson, loves to play with them. He comes in, and, and there's four of them, and he sits the three, he'll sit three of them down on the floor, and then he'll take one of them, and he'll just start dangling that one magnet and pretty soon, all of the other magnets snap together and snap up to that one magnet. They all come together. And he laughs and laughs and laughs. And he pulls them all apart and he does it again. But uh, this, is, this, is, this is what happens when the Holy Spirit comes. That there's this, there's this, there's this, there's this. But it's all the manifestation of God moving in and working among us. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So it's the Lord showing up. It's that God has made himself known to us. The manifestation of the Spirit. Um, 
And it's the same way with the fruit of the Spirit. We're going to talk about the fruit of the Spirit in another, in an, at another time. But, but when you see, Jesus said, you'll know my disciples by their fruit, and you'll know people that are not my disciples by their fruit. Uh, what you'll see in my disciples is a manifestation of the Spirit, singular. And what that manifestation will look like is love, joy, peace, patience, long-suffering these kinds of things. So I, I, even though they're diverse in what, what's going on, it's all the one and the self, same spirit manifesting himself, showing himself, either in a body or through an individual's life. Amen? Any questions or comments on that? Yeah, Jesse? Just, just a second. Uh, Okay, okay, hang on a second. I'll, I'll take care. We, we had a hand here, so we'll just stay in order here. Go ahead, Jesse. That's a good way to look at it, sure. That's a great question. We're going to get to that question because that's a very important uh, opening question for this. Very, very important. So we'll get to it. Uh, and, uh, and I will answer it tonight, I promise. Um, now, if I, you asked something else about... I think you got to one that... The common good. It's, it's given for the common good. It's to, it's to bless everyone, to reveal God's grace to everyone, not just to the one. And we'll talk about what that means in a minute because that's important. Um, now, uh, one other idea or, or words that you see a lot when you're studying the gifts of the Spirit is the idea of unity, um, the gifts and unity. Uh, let's take a look at that for just a moment. Um, 1 Corinthians 12. Will someone read verses 11 to 14 for us, please? 11 to 14 of 1 Corinthians 12. Go ahead. Um, 13 through uh, 14 as well. Mm -hmm. Just go on. Now this, this, uh, Discussion on the unity of the body is, is in Paul's discussion of the spiritual gifts. It's not something that you separate out to talk about how we need to get along with one another. It's a part and it's central to Paul's teaching on the operation of the gifts of the Spirit in, in the church. And uh, it's that way for a reason. One of the interesting things as you study the, the gifts, there are three major lists of the gifts of the Spirit in the New Testament. And uh, let's, let's uh, uh, take a look at them. And I want you to see something about them because it's very important for what we're doing. 1 Corinthians 12, 8 through 10, uh, is the Holy Spirit distributing these gifts as he wills. He says, uh, For to one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit, to another, the word of knowledge, according to the same Spirit. To another, faith, by the same Spirit. And to another, gifts of healing, by one Spirit. And to another, the effecting of miracles. And to another, prophecy. And to another, the distinguishing of spirits or discernment. To another, various kinds of tongues. And to another, the interpretation of tongues. Um, 
verse 11, but the one and the same Spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually just as he wills. So that's one of the lists of the, of the gifts, and we're going to study each one of those and discover what those are and how they work. But go over to another list, and that's in Romans 12. Turn over to another list of the gifts in Romans 12. And verse 6. Since we have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, there's that word charis, um, Each of us is to exercise them accordingly, if prophecy, according to the proportion of his faith, if service in his serving, or he who teaches in his teaching, or he who exhorts in his exhortation, or he who gives with liberality, he who leads with diligence, he who shows mercy with cheerfulness. Um, What do I want you to see there? Um, I'm sorry, I'm I'm just losing my train of thought here. I'll get it back. Aha, here. Verse 3. For though the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think more highly of himself than he ought to think, but to think so as to have sound judgment as God has allotted to each a measure of faith. He goes through this, and it's God giving these, these gifts, God giving the measure of faith. He uses in this one the word God, whereas in 1 Corinthians, he uses the Spirit giving the gifts. Go over to Ephesians, Ephesians 4. Ephesians 4, verse 7. But to each of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, he says, when he ascended on high, he led captive a host of captives, and he gave gifts to men. Now, this expression, he ascended, what does it mean except that he also had descended into the lower parts of the earth? He who descended is himself, who also ascended far above all all the heavens so that he might fill all things. And he gave some as apostles and some as prophets, some as evangelists and some as pastors and teachers. Uh, And here it's Christ giving the gifts. Now, what I want you to see here, in these three lists of of the gifts of the Spirit, we have in Romans, God, the Father, giving gifts. We have in 1 Corinthians, the Spirit distributing gifts. We have in Ephesians, the uh, Christ uh, giving gifts. Now, it's not meant to separate God. What this is meant to do is show the activity of a triune God in the gifting of the church. That's what I want you to see. It's the, the, what we receive as the gifts of the Spirit are the activity of the Father and the Son and the Spirit in this. Why is that important? Why is that important? Any thoughts? That's the key. That's the key. We see the the Godhead delivering to the church the gifts gifts of God, the the spiritual gifts. And and that same unity, that same uh, uh, sense of the involvement of, how do I say it, the involvement of the Father and the Son and the Spirit it works in the way, that, the way that we reflect the Lord in the gifts. That unity in the church. Uh, one of the things that happens when the gifts are at work, the way they're supposed to be at work, is that it binds the people of God together and makes us stronger as a people. Now, it's sad because one of the things that gifts are noted for in our culture is division. 
we, you know, there's sources of argument. And God never meant for it to be that way. They're meant to be unifying factors. The manifestation of the Spirit is a unifying factor. And so the Father and the Son and the Spirit are involved in the gifting of the church because his heart is that we be a people who are unified in our hearts. We're one in our mission. We're one in our spirit, and we're one in our experience of God. And so this idea of unity keeps coming around in the discussion on the gifts, and we'll see it in several passages of Scripture, and, and Paul is constantly connecting unity and the manifestation of the gifts of the Spirit. And I just wanted you to see that this, this um, the unity that makes the Trinity one is the same unity offered to the body of Christ to make us one. And uh, uh, we'll, we'll work on that a little more, but I think that's so important for us. Gifts should be a unifying factor to the church. If they're dividing the church, there's something wrong. If they're a source of division, if they're a source of factions, if there is a source of arguments, I've got this and you've got that and I'm better than you and you're blah, 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 blah. There's, there's something wrong. And any doctrine, any doctrine that would try to divide out the Holy Spirit away from Jesus or cut off one of the members of the Godhead uh, in terms of involvement with the church, in terms of empowering the body of Christ, is missing the point of the gifts. Because this thing is all about unity. It is not about factions. And it's not about division. And one of the motivations that I had for teaching this class was I, I want so desperately to build a church that really gets unity. Hallelujah. What could happen in this community if there was a church that, had, that, that moved in one accord? What could happen? Amen? And so it comes down to how we understand uh, the, the gifts of the Spirit and the operation of the Spirit in our lives. And one of the biggies is unity. Praise the Lord. Yes, question over here. Good, good. That's a good thought. That's a good thought. Amen. Other thoughts, ideas. Yes, Jesse. It's got to be. It's got to be. I, how many think that God would answer Jesus' prayers? <laughs> John, Jesus prayed this in John 17. I've got to believe, I've got to believe that somewhere in the kingdom, that prayer can be answered. And part of it is, is what goes on in us. But part of it is us coming to a point of, of really understanding what these things are for and what it's all about so that we can come into one accord on the gifts. As long as we have a, a, a fragmented understanding of the gifts, then we're not going to have unity. If some people see gifts as a power thing, then, and, and someone else sees them as service, and some, someone else sees it as, as uh, uh, Christian uh, witchcraft, and someone else sees it as something else, then, then there's always going to be these factions. And so part of the role of a teacher is to just be as faithful as possible in teaching the word as clearly as possible with the, with the prayer and the desire and the hope that we'd come into one accord and we'd, we'd move forward in this. And so I've got to believe that God can do it. I've got to believe that he can. Well, you couldn't turn this around. So you've turned this around. I've seen places where it's a lot further down the road than we are, definitely. Yeah. And part of it is uh, that the, 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 the more glaring the enemy is, the, the more glaring the kingdom is. And so if you go into a persecuted church, uh, like I've been in house churches in the Middle East, and I've been in persecuted churches in Belarus and in other places, 
uh, where when that's there, the enemy is so clearly identified. Uh, the enemy has skin on. And so it's just easier to, to, to come into one accord to defend your life. But when the enemy is fuzzy like it is in America, the enemy is much more, we're much more comfortable with the enemy here. We talk like him and we dress like him and we, you know, and, and all this stuff. And so as long as he stays fuzzy, we don't, we're not too concerned about, you know. And so uh, part of it is, is recognizing the darkness and, and how glaring it really is and then recognizing the light and how glaring it is. And God will do that in our lives. I think we're getting there. America's on its way. And I welcome it. Praise the Lord. I, I just, we've got to, if we're going to see re true revival, then we've got to get there. We can't keep compromising. Yeah. Mm hmm There's a super, yeah, there's a supernatural dimension to unity because it's a part of the essence of God. Absolutely. Absolutely. Good. Pardon? Absolutely. Yeah, we should be desiring. Praise the Lord. Praise God. Well, let me just, uh, I'll go a little further, and then if you have other questions or comments, just grab me here. Um, two, two questions that I just want us to think about. One of them is, what is the overall purpose of the spiritual gifts? What are they for? What, what's it about? And this, again, gets, it just gets fuzzy uh, in church cultures. And so um, I thought we would take just a moment and, and try to hit this. Um, I mentioned before uh, in, in, other, in other lessons, and, and I, but I feel like it needs to be emphasized again, that you and I are citizens of another kingdom. When you receive Jesus as your Savior, you, something happens to you on a, on a level that not too many people really think about. And that is that you, when I used to tell my students in Russia, and I used to get this big laugh every time, I'd take my American passport, and I'd say, I have a false passport. And they'd go, oh, because false passports are a big deal in a Soviet country. <laughs> and i say, it says America, but I'm not a, really a citizen there. I'm a citizen of heaven. You know, that's where I belong. And they all laugh. Um, but we are citizens of another kingdom. We have another God than the God of this world. And... Because of that, um, earth for us is a war zone. The life that we live is, is a, a life that, just by the fact that we're alive, engages us in a cosmic uh, war between the kingdom of light and the kingdom of darkness. Before we got saved, before we entered into the kingdom, we were just, we were, we were just flowing along with, with the river that's, that flows. You know, we were just like a fish going right down the stream. We, didn't, we weren't bothered by the enemy. We weren't, we weren't trying to uh, live counter-culturally uh, to, to what was there. We were just part of the world, and it was fine. Our, our life stunk, but it was, it was the way everybody was. And when you get saved, you start going back up the river instead of down the river, and things begin to crash into you, and, and things get difficult, and it's part of it. It's a war zone, and there is a real enemy, and that real enemy is out to steal and kill and destroy us. And that's not spiritually speaking alone, that's physically speaking. It's, he wants to kill us. And the simple fact is that you can't survive as a Christian in zone without some kind of supernatural empowerment. You cannot make it without the Spirit of God. You, you can't do this thing uh, on your own strength. And the Bible is full of exhortation about that. Uh, from Genesis to Revelation, constantly telling us you can't do this alone. You, you, you can't you can't try to be one of God's people without belonging to God. 
and having his strength. And you can't proclaim and demonstrate the kingdom that you're a part of without the power of that kingdom empowering you. And we've talked about that. Um, we are representatives of another kingdom, and it's a supernatural kingdom. And in order to function, uh, we, we have to be able to function in a supernatural way. And so God has given us the gifts of the Holy Spirit so that he can manifest that part of the kingdom of God that is supernatural, that does not exist in the world that we see. And that's why uh, sometimes when Jesus would lay hands on people and they were healed, he didn't talk about healing. He said, the kingdom of God has come upon you. And where the kingdom of God is, there is no sickness, and so sickness has to go. And so the person gets healed. We, we need the Spirit. We, and we've talked about this a lot. I know you're probably here, tired of hearing me say it, but we, we need the Spirit, and we need the power of manifested grace in order to do what Jesus saved us to do. Jesus said, go into all the world and make disciples of every, of every nation. You can't do that without the power of the grace of God. It's just impossible to do it. You can talk about it. You can build institutions. You can dress everybody up and make them into white Americans instead of black Africans. You can do all kinds of stuff. But if you're really bringing a kingdom to bear in a people's life, you have to have the supernatural dynamic of that kingdom going on in your life. And so the scriptures refer to this idea, and here, here's where I think we, 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 we don't understand and maybe we do, maybe I just maybe I don't understand, but the scripture refers to this idea, and God, if we could just get this. Holy Spirit, just right now, just reveal. Let a spirit of revelation come into our hearts and let us see this like we've never seen it before. The scriptures refer to this idea as edification edification. Now you have your little blanks in there and your outline to edificate, not education, <laughs> edification. And this is an incredibly powerful concept in the kingdom of God and it has been changed into entertainment. And, 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 and I just pray that we can just hear what the Spirit is saying about this because it'll help us. Let's look at these scriptures. Uh, uh, would so, who would read 1 Corinthians 14, 3 through 5 for us? Who's got that? Okay. And then verses 12 and 17, in, also in 1 Corinthians 14. Who's got that? 1 Corinthians 14, verses 12 and 17. Who will read that for us? Okay. Yeah. Um, oh, and, and 26 too, Al, if you would. And then also 1 Corinthians 8, 1. Who's got that? Okay. And uh, would you read 10 as well? 1 and 10. And then uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 23. Who will read that? Okay. Okay. Edification. Keep in mind, what is the purpose of the spiritual gifts? 1 Corinthians 14, 3 through 5. What does that say? Verses 12, 17, and 26. So also you, since you are zealous of spiritual gifts, seek to abound for the edification of the church. For you are giving thanks to all men, but the other man is not edified. Since you, since you are sometimes reverent, when you settle, each one has a psalm and a teaching and a revelation of the tongue as an interpretation that all things be done for edification. Mm -hmm. 1 Corinthians 8, 1.
Okay, and verse 10. Okay, and then uh, 1 Corinthians 10, 23. Okay. The spiritual gift is given to, through, <laughs> you kind of combine those two, to through. A gift is never given for you to just hold on to. A gift is always given for you to use. To, it's to flow through you. Remember, it's the grace of God. It's a manifestation of God's grace. And it's given to you, through you, for the edification of others in the body. It is not, not, not about me. The gifts of the Spirit are never about me. They are always about Building up the body of Christ. Now, that word, edification, has become so watered down in our culture that it makes me want to barf. It's that I'm feeling down, and I came to church, and, and so-and-so had a prophecy. Oh, it just edified. It just, I just felt so good, and now I can go back and watch my soap operas, and everything's better. You know, it's just, that's not it at all, you know. Or, uh, you know, so-and-so was rude to me, and he needs to be more edifying, and so that he needs to talk more politically correct, and yada, 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 yada. But edification is, works on a much deeper level than that. In order to be, for edication, edification to take place, supernatural stuff has to be going on. Because if we're going to make it, in this war zone, then our inner man, our inner woman has to be empowered supernaturally. It has to be constantly being strengthened supernaturally. And so the gifts are given to the church. That supernatural manifestation of the Spirit is operating in the church to do something supernaturally in your life. Hallelujah. It's not about entertainment. It's not about making lousy singers better singers. It's not about taking depressed people and making them feel good enough to watch three soap operas. It's not about that. It's about transforming something inside of us that, that senses that we live in a war zone and I'm getting smacked around and I come together and the Spirit of God manifests Himself and gifts begin to move and something inside of me changes. And my inner man, my inner self, that part of me where that, that is the, 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 the dwelling place of God, becomes strong and it becomes hard and it becomes firm and it becomes able to handle the stuff that goes on out there. Hallelujah. Edification is building us up in our most holy faith. It's making it possible so that when we pray, it's not just requests, it's spiritual warfare spoken in spiritual authority and pulling down dark strongholds in people's lives. Hallelujah. You can't do that unless you're edified. So edifying isn't about a bless me club. Edifying is about taking these, these, these supernatural things that God has given us in the gifts and applying them to the lives of God's people when we gather together. Hallelujah. And doing something in you, doing something in me that strengthens me so that I can go out there in the world and know that it's a war zone out there, but I'm going to not only survive, but I'm going to thrive. Hallelujah. I'm not just going to survive. I'm going to thrive because I've been edified when I come together with brothers and sisters in Christ and the gifts are manifested. And when the gifts aren't manifested, we're not being edified. Whew. When the gifts aren't being manifested, we're not being edified. We might be entertained. We might be blessed, we might feel good, we might want to come back, but we're not being biblically edified. 
the root of edification is uh, where we get our word edifice. What's an edifice? What is an edifice? An edifice is a building. An edifice is a tower. An edifice is something you look at and it's a solid structure that's in place and it's established. It's an edifice. God does that inside of us when we're being edified. Hallelujah. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. and He's building that tower inside of us because you are the temple of the Holy Spirit. And so he's building that inside of you and it makes you strong. Hallelujah. So that you go out of here into the war zone. You go out strong. You go out with something inside of you that's been established. Something weak has been strengthened. Something twisted has been made right. Hallelujah. We desperately, desperately need the gifts of the Spirit in operation in our church because we need strong Christians. We need to be able to thrive in a war zone. And that's what edification is about. Turn to somebody next to you and say, that's cool. <laughs> Any questions or comments? I just, uh, I pray that we get so hungry for this as a church that whatever else is going on, this is what we hunger and thirst for. Because Jesus said, blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness for they will be filled. They will be edified. Um, in the context of a worship service, uh, for example, Paul, when he teaches on, on this he never speaks of, uh, of edifying yourself. He says, he says one place in 1 Corinthians 14, he says that he who speaks in a tongue edifies himself, but it's better that he interpret so that he can edify the body. It's always better, whatever gift you have, it's always better if you can use that gift to build up the body. Why? Because of this. Because we desperately need to be strengthened, edified. So the goal of the manifestation of any gift is, is not the happiness of the one using the gift. Um, we live in a culture um, that is self-actualized. It means that uh, we, we, all of our basic needs are met, and so what we start doing is looking for wants and desires. And what this does, if we'll allow the Holy Spirit to do this, is help us to see that our basic needs aren't met because we go out there in that war zone and we get beat up. We go out there in a war zone and people who love God, their marriages are falling apart. People who love God are losing their children. People who love God are, 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 are living in cycles of, of poverty and, and deceit and, and and unemployment and broken because, because this war zone that we live in uh, hits us. And so it's not about our happiness. It's always about building up the church. It's always, always, always about that. You'll never, one of my gifts is teaching. I know that. It's one of my spiritual gifts as a teacher. And, and before God, uh, every time I get in front of you, I want to build you up. I want to strengthen you. I want to edify you. I, I, I wouldn't ever use the gift of teaching or preaching just to share information, but to edify the body of Christ. Why? Because we, we need it. We can't survive without this. And so it's always about building up the church. Hallelujah. So somebody will say, well, I just, I just... 
I have to prophesy. I, I'm not fulfilled unless I'm doing my thing. Well, it's not about you doing your thing. It's about you edifying the church, building up the church. Um, the gifts are not given to make us feel good about ourselves, but they're given to build up the body of Christ. There, there's just the, this incredible selflessness uh, when it comes to um, the use of the gifts. They are service, they're ministry. Listen to just a couple of, of uh, things that Paul says. 1 Corinthians 12. 1 Corinthians 12. Um, He says, um, but to each one is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. You've been given the gifts, why? For the common good. Uh, verse 14, for the body is not one member, but many. If the foot says, because I'm not the hand, I'm not a part of the body, it's, uh, it is not for this reason any less a part of the body. And if the ear says, because I'm not an eye, I'm not part of the body, it's not for this reason any less a part of the body. Uh, and he, he goes on in that, in that vein. But, but the, the idea here is that there is a selflessness that's connected to the manifestation of the Spirit, a selflessness involved in the gifts. It's never about self-expression. And I've had people since I've been here pastoring this church who, and I'll just tell they've left the church because I didn't get into their self-expression. For them, it was about self-expression, and I was quenching their self-expression, and they left the church. Sorry. It's not about me. It's about you. Hallelujah. I love you too much to just let people just do their own thing. We, there's too much at stake you guys, you guys are interceding for a beautiful woman who has cancer, and, 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 and right now, unless we see a miracle, the enemy's going to get her. And that means way more to me than somebody wanting to express themselves. Puke. We've got too much to do. Yeah. Sorry? Building yourselves up in your most holy faith. There is, there is a self, yeah, and Paul says that as well. Praying in the spirit, building yourself up. There's no question we need to be doing that, absolutely. Uh, we need to be building ourselves up in our most holy faith. We need to be, he who prays in an unknown tongue edifies himself, and that's just a part of what we should do every day. But corporately, Paul, and what I'm talking about here is corporately, the gifts that are manifested, in, that, that there, there needs to be again the idea that I'm not here to edify myself. When I am used in a gift, whatever that gift is, it is not about me edifying myself at that point. It is about me edifying you. And so Paul says, if you're used in a tongue, pray that you can interpret or be quiet and let someone else do it. Why? Because the edification of the body is so, so, so important because it's a war zone out there and you need to be strengthened. Hallelujah. That's the spirit of this. Thanks, David. We're going to get squashed, man. That's right. And that's a part of that edification, too. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. And that's something that we're always appropriating, aren't we? And what happens or what should be happening in the context of corporate assembly is the edifying of the believers. It should just be a part of what we do building us up together because we need it. And that's what the gifts of the Spirit are given for is the edification of the body of Christ. Not the entertainment of the body of Christ, not the education of the body of Christ, but the empowering and the strengthening and the deepening and the hardening of the body so that you can go out there into a war zone and make it. Hallelujah. Any other comments or questions on? Yeah, here and then here.
Praise the Lord. <laughs> Amen. And God will use that to strengthen somebody else. Yeah. Did you have something? Oh, okay. Okay. The second question then that I want to address in the time that we have here is kind of gets back to Jesse's question. Um, we've talked about speaking in tongues. We've said that um, that speaking in tongues is the initial physical evidence of the baptism in the Holy Spirit. Uh, and the, there's a question that comes out of that that relates to the gifts. And that is, beyond speaking in tongues, does every spirit-filled believer possess at least one spiritual gift? Has everybody been given one? Now, I've given you a whole bunch of scriptures there. And uh, we're, we're low on time, but I, I encourage you to read through all those scriptures. And what you'll come to is a, it's pretty heavy theological, it's a little intricate, but I think I could sum up what all of these scriptures are saying in one word, and that would be yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, it is very clear, biblically, you can see it in these scriptures, that there is no passive membership in the body of Christ. There is no, there is no, and I've preached about it, you've heard me preach about it before, there's no such thing as, as an audience in the kingdom, in the body, that we all have a part to play, and that these scriptures, if you go through, if you go through them, you'll find that um, every believer has been given at least one other gift besides tongues, but maybe some people, and it, you know, Usually you have about three, my experience has been anyway, with teaching and pastoring over the years, that most people have about three that they, they've been used in uh, regularly in their lives. And uh, we, have a, we have a shape uh, seminar that we do where you kind of discover what your gifts are and what, how God works in your life individually and, and, and where you can kind of find out what those are about. And we'll offer that again, uh, and you can, you can look at that. But the, the quick answer is yes, everybody does. The key here is, though, that no one person, and this is why this is important, though, no one person has all the gifts. I don't care how long they've been a Christian. They don't flow in all of the gifts of the Spirit. If they did, they wouldn't need anybody else, and that's just the, not the way God's designed is his, his church, his people. We are interdependent. We need one another because uh, the gifts that you have, I don't have. Gifts I have, you don't have. And we relate to each other and we need one another in that way. That's what makes us strong a a as, a, as a body. Um, uh, we may have more than one, but, uh, and Paul encourages that. He says, listen, if you, if you have the gift of tongues, Pray that you might be able to interpret as well. So again, so that you're edifying uh, the body. Um, he also says in 1 Corinthians 12, 31, that we should eagerly desire the best gifts. Eagerly desire the best gifts. Now that means a couple of things. Number one, that we can seek the Lord for a gift. We can ask God to give us a gift. I remember when I was starting in, in missions, I was going into a lot of countries, and, and one of the things that you learn real fast about cross-cultural work is that your instincts, the instincts that work in your home culture don't work in another culture. The, the people can dress like you, they can drink Coca-Cola just like you, they can like you, they can, even both of us can speak English, but they're instincts and my instincts are completely different. My worldview and their worldviews, and I ask God for the gift of wisdom. God, just please, Lord, I need your wisdom, but then I need the spiritual gift of the word of wisdom in order to do this. And, and the Lord, and, and when we talk about the word of wisdom, uh, we'll see why that, that one is so incredibly important, but I, I desperately needed that. But so you can desire gifts, and God will give you. God, Jesus says, I will, God, God wants to give these things to you. But what is the best gift? What's the best gift? Okay. 
Okay. One that fits you. Yeah. Wisdom. That's a goodie. The one that's needed at the time. Yeah. The best gift. Like if, if somebody's sick, they don't need a prophecy. They need somebody with the gift of healing. <laughs> you know? And so the best gift is the one that's needed at the time. And so you'll find uh, as, as a believer, as you walk through life, you might be used in a gift. And it might only happen one time in your life. But, uh, but God will use you. You are there. You're, you love the Lord. You're, you're there for God to use, for the grace of God to be manifested. And you lay your hands on somebody, and it's never happened before or since, but you laid your hand on that person, and they were healed. Or you saw, you saw a demonic possession in somebody who was just as normal as the day is long, but God gave you the discerning of spirits, and you saw it. And it's never happened before or since, but it happened then, and it was the key to helping that person. And so there's times when God will use you in a gift, but then there's other, you have these gifts that you just, those are ones you just kind of constantly function in. And it might be the gift of prophecy. It might be tongues, an interpretation of tongues. It might be healing or miracles. It might be whatever it is, faith. Uh, but the Lord, the Lord gives gifts to all of us, and... Uh, and he decides, and uh, uh, Paul talks about that in 1 Corinthians 12, that the Holy Spirit gives gifts uh, according to his will. Who, who he wants to have what, he does it. It's his, it's his way. And he builds his body. So here's the key. Here's the key on this. No one will receive a gift against his will. Nobody in this room will ever receive something from God against their will, especially the gifts of the Spirit. I've heard people tell me, oh, I was just sitting there, and I didn't want this, but God got a hold of me, and he shook me, and I started to, give me a break. <laughs> no, God doesn't, God doesn't work against your will. If he did, then, then we wouldn't be free, and we are free moral agents. Um, A.T. Robertson is a brilliant theologian of a generation, of many generations ago, and he said... Our earnest desire for the best gifts is one of the things that fits us to receive them. And each person receives in proportion to his desire. Desire may be cultivated, and the Holy Spirit knows the capacity of each person. One of the things that the Lord showed me when we, when we started pastoring here was expand capacity. And you remember, you members especially remember that I talked about trenches, digging trenches that the Lord could fill, expanding our capacity as a body. And, and uh, this, uh, this man is talking about desire for the things of God, desire for the gifts of the Spirit can be cultivated. You might not have much now, but as you learn more about what it's for, your desire increases and you begin to pray more about it and God begins to give you more and more of a hunger uh, for those gifts and for that work in your life. And that can be cultivated and the Holy Spirit knows your capacity. He knows what you can handle. He knows that if he was to give you too much, it would blow you away. You'd get prideful and you'd walk away. And... But he also knows that he, he can trust you with so much that would blow somebody else away. And that's a fun place to be. <laughs> but he knows our capacity, and we can expand our capacity. And so the question is, are you operating in any of the gifts of the Spirit beyond speaking in tongues? It's for you, and it begins as you begin to desire the gifts. And so my purpose in teaching this is to show you what they are so that you can more completely begin to desire and hunger after the gifts. And God can begin to use you in those gifts. Hallelujah. But it begins with knowing what they're for. We live in a war zone and these gifts are given to us to strengthen us to handle that stuff out there. 
Hallelujah. So you don't just survive, but you thrive. I have to think about that question, okay? okay? Any other questions or comments? We good? Okay, the kids are going to be tearing the roof off here in a minute. But let's pray. Holy Spirit, I pray that the seed that has been cast this evening would find good soil and deep roots and much fruit. Lord, we're very aware of the time that we live in, and we're very aware of the kingdom of darkness and the devices of the enemy to lull us into sleep, to take the crux of what it means to manifest the grace of God in the world and turn it into something like entertainment or a hobby or a, something to look at. Would you burn the truth of your word deep in our heart? And would you cause the desire and the hunger for the things of God, for the gifts of the Holy Spirit to be manifested in us and in our church. Jesus, we just ask you to come and pour out your spirit and give, as your word says, just give us gifts as you will. You know our capacity. Begin to work in us, O oh Lord. And we thank you for what you'll do. And we know, Lord, we put our complete faith in you who said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against her. Lord, we thank you for that. And we want to get into building around here. And we thank you for it, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I love you guys.